Well, hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Kimberly Ford. I am the program director for the BSMIS and MSDA programs here at Colorado State University Global. I want to welcome you to our very first program webinar. I'm really excited about hopefully the first of many. Um, and I really want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to visit with us. The way that the webinar works is basically you're going to see me and David. Uh, <laughs> um, everyone is muted uh, just because, uh, you know, there are a lot of attendees and it just makes it easier to kind of manage the webinar. You've noticed I have enabled the auto transcriptioning. Um, I didn't say the word thing, but <laughs> I've enabled the auto transcription in case, um, you know, just to make sure that you don't miss anything that we say. Um, so one of the things, a couple of the little housekeeping tips is I encourage you to ask questions. Um, there are two ways you can do that. There's the chat area at the bottom. There's also the Q&A. So feel free to ask questions. This is not, um, while this is a formal webinar, I do wanna encourage you to ask questions. Um, this is not, you've gotta sit and listen. And who has an extensive analytics, data warehousing and such. He is a BI architect with Kajit. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Dr. Ford, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here uh, speaking with you. Uh, can you hear me okay, Dr. Ford? Cool, all right. Please raise your hand or let me know at any point if you can't or <clears throat> if I'm going too fast, please, and thank you. So yeah, my name is David Triber. Uh, I, am, I work uh, on the advanced analytics team at Kajit. Um, I think I may have misclassified them as a startup. I was talking to a friend about this and we have around 200 employees. So we're a little bit too big for a startup. However, in the telecom industry, um, it's a relatively small company. And uh, what we do is we provide wireless connectivity um, and over the past year, we have <clears throat> been a big help to schools during, during COVID because a lot of them uh, have gone remote, uh, fully remote, and the devices that, that my company produces uh, allow those students to stay in class. Uh, initially, they started to, um, they existed to help close the homework gap. So for children who didn't have Wi-Fi at home and needed to do homework at, uh, at home, the school district would buy them devices. But obviously during uh, pa the pandemic, the, the need for uh, school districts to provide for their students increased. And, and so I helped, I, I joined the, the company at that time. Um, and I'm doing some cool stuff now and I'll get to that, but I wanna give you a brief background of how I got here. Uh, and I wanna leave plenty of, of time for, for questions, because I don't like talking about myself too much, uh, but I'm sure you guys are interested about data. I love data. I think it's really cool, and you can do a lot of neat stuff with it, and it's taken me some interesting places, and I'm sure it will continue to do so. Um, so I started uh, my data journey as a filing clerk at Walden University, believe it or not. Uh, Dr. Ford, I don't know if you knew this, but I started, it was like a summer job when I was finishing um, some generals at a community college. And I was literally fi filing physical files, the student files, enrolling um, uh, cabinets in a locked room for the registrar's office. Uh, and I mean, it, this was data, these were student papers with grades and whatnot, and they needed to be alphabetized and put in the proper place. Um, so that was not terribly sophisticated. Uh, the, the next step was data entry, you know, a step up from physical filing, also in the in the registration office. And part of that included updating student information, um, batch registering students for classes, 
uh, maintaining records in spreadsheets. We all love spreadsheets, right? And um, I worked there for several years before things got interesting again. They actually closed down the office I was working in in Minneapolis. I had a chance to move out to Baltimore. Um, and there was, a, there was an interesting development the following year in that we moved um, student information systems. We moved from a, um, a platform called Datatel to Banner, which is uh, used by a lot of, of higher education institutions these days. And so uh, I became a lot more involved with data during the integration or, or migration from Datatel to Banner, right? So this was an opportunity that I might not have had somewhere else, uh, but I was able to test, you know, there were functional requirements. The system should do this. It looks like this in this system. It should look like this in the other system. And I found that I kind of liked it and I was very good at finding discrepancies or, or flaws or defects in how the, the migration was going. Uh, so that got me a little bit hungrier to see, well, how does the system work behind the scenes or how can I interact with more data? Um, and the migration was successful. <clears throat> and shortly thereafter, I started working uh, on a reporting team within the registrar's office. And we did very non-sophisticated reporting. It was ad hoc reporting uh, out of a, a system called, uh, or using a platform called Cognos, an IBM product. Um, and we produced basically spreadsheets for people. We, we extracted data from, from Banner, we put it into a spreadsheet, and then we would send it to people. Um, this is all fine and good. Um, but I think what we, what, what the team I was on, what we were good at is getting people their data quickly. They were used to waiting in line for a while. Um, and the BI team, the business intelligence team at the time, didn't take kindly to us providing data so quickly for other people. And so they, they sucked us into their, their team, which was another amazing opportunity. Um, somewhere in the middle of that, I, I started learning SQL from the, one of the gentlemen who helped build the banner um, student information system. Um, and that opened my, that was really my first foray into, into um, um, querying, and it unlocked a lot of potential for me. But when I joined the BI team and I started to get uh, more formal training in Cognos, which was the reporting platform, um, I found out I was pretty good at it, and I was able to turn things around, and people liked it. Um, by the way, Cognos is not something I would recommend that you ever go out of your way to learn. <laughs> Cognos is a kind of an arcane tool. It's really, really good if you need to build something pixel perfect for, for a certain audience. And, and it, it is very powerful, but the learning curve is very, very steep. Um, and it's, it's not intuitive like more modern uh, front end programs like Tableau or Power BI. Uh, um, or things like that. Uh, but in any, in any case, the experience that I got in Cognos served me well down the road. Um, I'd say that the only, um, one of the, the interesting opportunities I had was uh, I was able to take a dimensional modeling class in New York City and I took the, the Amtrak up from Baltimore and stayed in New York City for, for a week. And I learned a lot from Kimball, uh, Ralph Kimball, who was one of the pioneers or the pioneer of the dimensional modeling um, mindset. Um, and I can talk about that in more detail if anyone is interested in it. it, interested in it. Um, but the dimensional modeling class kind of, again, expanded uh, what I thought data could do. Um, and after that, I started building cubes in Cognos. The, the cubes were kind of like, a, well, it's what Tableau basically gives you, right? It's a, it's a pivot table on steroids, if you will. Uh, it, it takes the, the intersections of all, all the possible intersections of data and it, it pre-aggregates them so that you can drag and drop it and make reports very quickly. Um, then I built dashboards in Cognos, active reports for execs. And I was able to sit down with, with you know, the CFO, uh, 
I was able to go to conferences for Tableau and, and so on and so forth. Around a little bit uh, after this, uh, our company, uh, uh, Laureate Education at the time, um, started getting interested in Tableau and we introduced it to people. And after being exposed to Cognos, which is not very flashy or um, user-friendly, people love Tableau and it took off. And it was really neat to watch people take Tableau uh, and, and make really great content for it that, that other people would use. These are people that were very close to their own data. And with a little bit of handholding, they were able to pick up that product and do really amazing things with it. Um, one of the things we found is we built this community of practice, which eventually grew to be around three or 4,000 people, um, was that uh, Tableau is great if the data is in the right shape. If it's not in the right shape, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, but a Tableau isn't gonna fix dirty data or data that is in the wrong form. And so we introduced a tool called Alteryx, which is a, is a self-serve data prep tool. And I can't say that it had wide adoption. I personally, personally love the tool. I think it, it transforms data very easily and it's a lot more intuitive than something like Python. Um, but um, yes, Tableau is great, but getting the right data in the right shape is really important. Um, and, and so that that is kind of my journey. Um, I, I would say that during the process or towards the, the end of my time at Laureate, which I worked uh, at up until last year, uh, I was able to travel to Peru, uh, Brazil a number of times to train people there on Cognos, uh, to work on gathering requirements to build uh, ETL models, extract, transfer, and load models for them, um, refine requirements, do testing. Uh, and it was fantastic. Um, I, I never would have dreamed when I started um, getting into data that it would have taken me um, halfway across the world. And I, I can't imagine where it will take me uh, as I continue on this journey. Um, but a quick plug for, for Sao Paulo, I would say, if you ever have a chance to go, it might seem a little bit intimidating, um, but they have a great um, samba scene. It's a lot of fun and they have great food, unless you, unless you like vegetables, <laughs> then it might not be the best. Um, in any case, I started working for Gajit uh, last November uh, and I was brought in, um, to help build a data warehouse. And it is largely aligned on a dimensional model, right? And so we're capturing data that is coming out of a number of different systems. Uh, we're bringing them together and then we're exposing them via Tableau to our end users. Um, one of the cool things that we're doing uh, today that is a little bit different um, that I didn't do in my last job is we're ingesting data in real time click stream data from our customers. And we we're, we have about 2 billion rows a day of data coming in. And we have a tool that is rolling it up in near real time, I mean, within seconds, so that customers can click in and see which devices are using you know, too much data. Are they going to places that they shouldn't be? Do we need to adjust filtering policy? Those types of things. Because part of the platform that we offer is based around security and allowing our customers to control where the devices that they buy uh, can go, where the traffic can go, right? So they can block Facebook, Instagram, those types of things. And so giving the customer the ability to see that data basically in real time, I mean, within seconds of when the click happens, allows them to react very quickly to save them money if someone is going someplace that they should not. Let me pause there for just a second because I've I've talked quite a bit um, and see I, I see there's one question or there's one question in the chat and actually let me just pause here for a second and talk about the mindset that I bring to the table that I think has served me well um, and that is 
as Dr. Ford said, asking questions. It's very important, right? When someone comes to me and they say, I need this data, one of the first things that I'm gonna ask them is why. What are you gonna do with this data? If I, if I know why you're gonna use the data and I know the data myself, I know how the system works, I'm gonna probably be able to give you more than you're asking for so that you can fulfill the purpose, right? So I think understanding why someone needs the data is hugely important. Uh, and part of that is what actions are you gonna take, right? Are you gonna fire people because of this data? If I know that, I'm gonna spend a lot more time being very, very careful to make sure that data is double checked, triple checked, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the actions that someone is going to take with data is very important to know. Um, and I've also found that sometimes asking that question will lead to an answer, I'm not sure. And if someone doesn't know how they're going to use the data, it doesn't matter how well prepared it is. The, the value of that would, is questionable in my mind. Um, I think diving into, I, I mean, so from where I work, I enable other people to use the data, right? I'm not, I personally am not doing any statistical analysis on it, but the data that I collect is I cleanse it to make it easier for people downstream to do their work. Dr. Ford, I see you've, you have your, I think you're. There are a couple of folks who've raised their hand. Oh, okay. I raise my I I don't have I didn't mean to raise my hand I'm a doofus. <laughs> um, I, I've got one person. Well, Grace has asked about SAS um, in the chat. Um, Smokey, I see you've raised your hand. If you don't mind asking your question in the chat, we'll definitely we'll definitely respond to it. So Grace, I'll, I'll take a minute and talk about SAS. I have not used it personally, um, but I know that uh, working for, for Walden, that the, the institution, uh, the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, uh, they use that. Uh, Kim, I think where, where we met Dr. Ford, I think mm -hmm. your team used it as well. Uh, yep, the we use Center that. for Faculty, Faculty Excellence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't have a stats background, so I can't speak too highly to uh, too highly uh, or too much about that. Again, my background is more about getting the, the data in the right shape for it to be analyzed. Uh, and I can do a little bit of analysis myself, but it's pretty rudimentary compared to what folks with a deep stats background can do. Um, Snowflake is awesome. Snowflake may make uh, traditional data warehouses obsolete because you can dump your data into it. Uh, one of the benefits that a dimensional model produces is that it allows you to see, especially if you're doing uh, slowly changing dimensions, uh, of the type two SCDs where you're tracking history as you can see exactly what was happening at a given point in time, right? And this was very important when, um, the dimensional model was was founded by by Ralph Kimball a, a number of years ago. Um, but as storage has become cheaper and cheaper and computing has accelerated, uh, a lot of people argue that the, the dimensional model or data warehousing is less important. I wouldn't say that it's obsolete right now, but I would say that it's quite possible it will become obsolete. Um, but the, the, the one thing I would say is that even if you, um, it, it's still gonna make querying your data a lot more efficient and easier to understand because imagine, and this is what we're doing in Druid. We, we, uh, our real-time analytics is, is in Druid. Druid, it, it is rolling up the billions and billions of rows in real time. Um, it is basically taking a snapshot of the system moment after moment after moment. Right, and so it is tracking largely the same information. There's only a few things that are changing, but it's it is tracking. This attribute is the same. This attribute is the same. Someone's phone number doesn't change, right? So that is replicated again and again and again. Um, and it's, again, storage storage is cheap, but when the data gets very big, um, a dimensional model 
there might be a balancing act to be found there. Um, Snowflake is also, if you're not careful, very expensive. Um, I think that there are other people competing for that space. One of the one of the vendors that we're, we've evaluated or, or thought about evaluating is Firebolt, um, but I can't speak much about that. I'll say that using Snowflake uh, was a pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I don't use it at my current job, but I used it in my prior role. Uh, it works very well with Tableau, with Alteryx. Um, they, 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 they're really well uh, integrated. They, they made integration between the two systems very nice. Um, so, Dave, another thing, yeah. Oh, I was going to say there's a, a really good question in the Q and A about cleaning data. Uh, sure. Let, let let me take a look. Okay. Uh, let me just say one other thing about data warehousing. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. So, in a, so with dimensional modeling, if you have a conformed dimension, uh, let's say customer or product, you define that once, right? And, and, and if you have, the, you have the grain of that dimension, one row per customer, one row per product, that doesn't really change. And then if you want to measure other business process and fact tables, which is part of the dimensional model, you can add as many fact tables as you want, as many business processes as you want, and you can recycle those conform dimensions again and again, which is very powerful. I mean, people who are using Snowflake uh, still do this. Um, that said, you could snapshot all of the data moment after moment, uh, and it would work. The cost would add up over time, though I think there's a balancing act. Uh, very good question. I don't know how to, if I'm gonna say your name right, but Faisal. Very good question. Um, Lena, good learning materials or website to prepare, prepare for working in the future as a data analyst. Uh, so learning materials, I would say networking is probably, would probably be my, my go-to. If you're learning a specific tool, uh, look for a meetup in your area uh, where, the, where people are discussing it. I think building relationships and, and talking about or seeing what people are doing with their data is a really good way of learning and opening um, opening up I new ideas. Um, I'd say that I don't know what it's like in other areas, but the Twin Cities has uh, a really great analytics um, um, community. They have a thing every year here, at least before the pandemic, uh, called Mini Analytics, and it basically was a day-long hackathon competition where a thousand people would come together and work on a cool problem. And you know, just think about that opportunity: uh, being able to just sit in a room with someone else working through a, pro uh, a problem in real time. Uh, I think that would be that would be really uh, useful. Um, in terms of websites to work as a, to prepare for working as a data analyst. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you, you're in this class, I, I think, and that probably is going to be a pretty good preparation for being a data analyst. Um, if you want to see what other people are doing, I think there's cool stuff on Tableau Public. I think Dr. Ford has, has mentioned that. And if you guys go there from time to time, you might be inspired. Um, but I think, you know, each company is going to do a little, a little bit differently. But diving in and understanding the data, that is, that is really the key. Um, figuring out what the business rules are, trying to, to understand the process. When someone does something over here, how does it impact everything downstream? If I understand the process, then I understand how to set up an analytics platform on, on top of it to make sure that it, we're auditing to make sure that what is what should happen is happening to, um, to look for outliers and to manage performance. Um, Danny asks, that's a good question, Lena, and hopefully I gave you a little bit of, of something to, to think about. Uh, Danny asks, what is Kajit and where do they fit into the data marketplace? Uh, good question. So, Danny, the Kajit is um, 
is a relatively small telecom. And we basically, uh, we're competing in the same space as some other telecoms, but uh, companies like Verizon uh, like us and, and, and we resell their data as an example and, and other providers as well. Uh, but what we do is we provide our customers a secure platform for them to, uh, for, for example, uh, in, in education, the school districts will buy our devices because they know that the, the platform is secure, right? And so if they're giving them to the students, they know where they're, where they're able to go, where they're not able to go, and they're able to control costs. Um, Right, so there's there, basically we're buying, they're, they're buying our device and our, and our secure platform. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I mean, again, it's, we're in the telecom space. I think that in, in an enterprise uh, perspective, you think about healthcare. Healthcare needs these devices, right? If you have uh, a mobile clinic or something like that, you need a device that can uh, receive a signal, you need it to be secure, you need it to be reliable. Our company provides those as well. So we're in healthcare field services, uh, as well as education. And I'm not doing it justice fully. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit more background about what Khajiit is. Can you, hey, Dave, can you jump over to the Q&A and look at Ashita's um, question about cleaning data? Yes, Ashita. Uh, I just said that cleaning data is the most difficult task. Yes, it is. Uh, the tools that I use, um, I use SQL a lot. I love SQL. I mean, it's an old query language, but it's still, I mean, it's still great. Um, and I'm gonna lump this together with, with Joseph because he, he asks what SQL software are my favorites. I love dBeaver. dBeaver as in database, Beaver, Beaver, D Beaver. It's a silly name, but it's a it's a great universal client, right? So if you if you want to plug in the SQL Server, you can do that, no problem. Oracle, you can do that. Snowflake, uh, Postgres, doesn't uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a universal client, so you install it once, and then you just add connections. Uh, I love uh, D Beaver. In terms of data cleansing, you know Alteryx is pretty awesome, but it's a proprietary tool and it's expensive. I think it's five or six grand a year. And so for you to get your hands on that, you're probably gonna be working for a pretty big company who's got, who has some significant cash they're able to throw around. Um, I, let, me, um, let me just interject really quick. There is a software, uh, I think I'm frozen. I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. It looks like I'm frozen. Anywhere, anyway, I'm going to type in, there is a software because I started using Alteryx um, in the early days when Dave and I worked for the same company, but there is a software out there called Nine, K-N-I-M-E, that is very similar to what Alteryx does. It does have a steep learning curve but it is really a great data cleansing tool. Um, we don't use it yet here at the university, uh, but, um, but I did, but if, if anyone is interested in learning more about data cleansing and some of the tools that are available, I really, really like that tool and it's open source. You can download it for free. Again, very steep learning curve, but if, for those of you who are interested in, um, in, in cleansing, Take a look at that. Yeah, I've heard the name of that, uh, Dr. Ford. Uh, Talend is another one. Talend is, is a tool that I'm using right now for, for ETL, Extract, Transfer, and Load. And it's very powerful. And, it, and it, it has an open source version. So you can use it for free. You can go to the Talend website, download it, and use it for free. Uh, you can schedule things to run uh, on a machine that doesn't even have Talend. Uh, installed uh, because it produces Java code. And so as long as you have Java installed on, on a machine, you can export a job in Talent and then schedule it to run on another machine, right? So you might develop on your machine and then publish it to a more powerful server. Uh, and it's, again, it has, there's an open source uh, 
version of it, which is which is free. And it's pretty amazing, actually, I think that they offer it for free uh, because it's very powerful. I don't know how it compares to uh, Nime or Nime. I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, that's what I've been using. And there is a learning curve, but it's very powerful. Um, let's see. I don't know if I fully answered, let me go back to that in the Q and A. How much time does it take? It can take a lot of time. It really depends on how dirty the data is. Um, I've been working on cleansing data for months and months, and I'm not all the way done where, where I'm working. Um, I, I'm, I find bad data left and right. Part of it is a process issue. And when that occurs, I will escalate it to the data owners. Sometimes it, there's bad code in, in the, the platform, right? There's a defect in the platform. I find it, they have to go fix the, the system code and then the, and then the data is, is cleansed. I would say as a matter of principle, I do not like, I, I will not, unless I have very strict orders, I will not hide dirty data, right? If it's bad data, someone fat fingered it or something like that into the system, the data owner, in my opinion, needs to fix it, right? I think hiding bad data perpetuates a culture of, uh, uh, it, it allows people to get away with, with mistakes. And if you can see the data and you can audit it, there's no reason, no reason why you can't fix it. That might sound harsh, but um, cleansing data, bad data is, is, is rough. <laughs> it can take a lot of time. Um, Finding a tool that you like, it makes a huge difference. Uh, I mean, Tableau can be really great for, for cleansing data in that you can find outliers in the data very quickly, right? So if you have a tight cluster and then you, you see some outliers, very likely that's bad data. And if you can visually see that, then you can attack that much more quickly. Um, so hopefully that, that gives you some idea of uh, where I'm coming from, Ishida. Um, back to Joseph, how do you feel about GUI tools for providing timely and scalable resources to business teams? So um, the SQL software, again, the dBeaver, I think is a great platform. In, in terms of um, the flavor of SQL, it doesn't really matter to me. Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres are all great. Snowflake is great. They all have slightly different syntaxes, I think. Um, Snowflake actually might be Postgres. I can't remember. Uh, they're all they're all great. Um, in terms of a GUI SQL tool, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, if it's something other than like an Oracle developer or DBeaver or SQL Server, um, if that if I'm misunderstanding your question, please uh, enter a follow up. Uh, Grace asked, asks, is Khajiit a competitor for Go Guardian? Um, I do not know. It is possible. I don't know anything about Go Guardian, so I am going to Google them really quick. Ed tech company. I would say no. They're an ed tech company. Uh, well, maybe. Maybe they are a competitor. Uh, but they are specifically in the uh, K through 12 space, uh, whereas Khajiit offers some of that, but um, our, our breadth of customers is a little bit wider as we have uh, IoT companies as well that we serve. Um, Faisal, again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Can you give an example of a data cube, a data mart, and a data lake? Uh, yes, a data cube is, again, um, basically a pre-aggregated intersection of data. So imagine you have, um, you, you have a fact table that shows sales, and you have a, a dimension uh, that has time and a dimension that has product. A cube would be the intersection where the, the middle basically is the, the sales figures, the, the dollars and cents. 
and everything describing it would be the time, it would be the dimensions, right? You might have time and then you might have product, right? And so you can slice, you can get a slice of that cube by saying, well, I'm gonna pick these dates and this product. And it will be very quick to respond because all those intersections of data have been pre-populated. Uh, a data mart is basically a collection of uh, dimensional models aligned around a certain function, like sales and marketing or finance. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, sales and marketing data mart might have a fact table um, uh, around leads or opportunities, Salesforce data, that kind of thing. Whereas the finance data mart might have a fact uh, around, you know, uh, expenditures, uh, profits and losses, um, you know, customer revenue, th those types of things. And the dimensions might cross cut between data marts, right? Time is a classic one. Your, your, the date dimension would, would not belong to a single data mart because it would be able to, to describe both sales and marketing processes as well as finance ones. A data lake, an example of that would be, um, well, the one that we use, right, or the one we use at Kajit is uh, Amazon. Uh, when people talk about a data lake, it's usually on one of the three big clouds, Microsoft, Amazon, or Google. Uh, we, we use AWS, and it's basically a repository for all your data to reside. It's a, basically a cheap way of storing your data so that you can retrieve it without having to structure it. So in, in Amazon, uh, the, the, the main product for, the, for a data lake would be S3, which is a, a, a basically this ch very cheap storage. And so you can throw a bunch of data in there and you can, um, you can integrate it with systems so that it automatically, new, new files are posted there. Uh, and then you can retrieve it later if you need it and put it in uh, to um, a database or you can query it directly using something like Athena. Um, I would say data lakes, in my experience, can get very big and very messy. And the, the value is hard to realize if there's not some thought into how things are partitioned. Um, it's, it's not a black and white kind of thing, but it's basically a, a, just this big storage uh, repository for, for data that you want to maybe come back to later. Um, let's see. Jamie asks, have you tied data grip? I have not. Uh, data grip. Data grip cross platform IDB or databases in SQL. Uh, I have not. But it looks pretty cool. So one thing I wish that I would have learned uh, that I am still kind of learning, but I'm not very strong in is Python. I think if you want to do data cleansing, Python can do that very, very well. Um, I just don't know the I don't know the language well enough to speak about it with any type of authority. Um, I I'll look into data grip more. Jamie, thanks for asking that question. Um, Joseph asks, what is the name of the software for data cleansing? Yep, there you go. Uh, I would say, you know, Python again would be another one. Let me go to the, uh, the Q&A real quick. Jacob Miller asks, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. I am not in the MSDA program. I'm pursuing the MS for machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm about halfway through the program and facing an internal dilemma. I'm really struggling on if I should switch to the MSDA program. It would come at a decent cost of time and money. If I were to stick it out, are the career opportunities for people with strictly AI ML backgrounds at companies like yours or in other uh, DSDA companies? I would say stay where you are. That's my initial thought, Jacob, because um, honestly, I feel like a lot of what I do could be automated at some point. And the AI and ML stuff is where the really interesting and bleeding edge stuff is, is happening today. And if I don't know how far you're about halfway through the program, I mean, if you enjoy it, 
I would stick with it because there's a huge demand for, for uh, people who know machine learning and AI. I mean, my company, we haven't hired a data scientist yet because we're still working on cleaning the data. Um, and, but once we do, we will bring in someone who has that type of background um, because we're gonna be able to do a lot more sophisticated things uh, with it. Um, so again, that's my initial thought. I would say machine learning, AI, there's a huge and lucrative market for that. Um, so ho hopefully that, that gives you some perspective. Um, all right. Speaking of healthcare, Nicholas says, do you recommend getting a health informaticus master's to break into the field or does the certificate do enough? Um, I don't know much about the healthcare industry, honestly, Nicholas. So I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that question, I'm afraid. Um, networking might be a good opportunity to talking to someone in the field who works in the healthcare field. They might be able to address it better than I can. Um, I think, you know, the job market can be very tough. Uh, and I think, you know, breaking in someplace and getting someone to take a chance on you if you're new in an industry is, is hard. But once you hit the ground and you're able to get some experience, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel very fortunate. I've had a lot of breaks along the way. Um, and I, I have I have three daughters and I I don't know that they're going to have the same opportunities that I do just because, you know, things are becoming more competitive. Uh, edge, uh, I, I guess I won't go down that path too much. But yeah, I mean, getting a break is huge. Uh, and I feel super fortunate that I've had a number of them along the way. Jamie says, highly recommend Data Grip over Deep Beaver. I'm definitely going to check it out. Thank you for the recommendation. Uh, let's see, Dwight asks, what sort of non-technical skills do you see as important or valuable to use in a data-driven field? Great question. A lot of the people who work, at least in the business intelligence space, um, are, they tend to be um, most comfortable given requirements, technical requirements, and they may not be comfortable in front of other people. Um, you know, I think if you're in this program, uh, people skills are, uh, uh, are probably going to be more of a strong suit for you than some other people. Um, but I'd say knowing how to talk to people is pretty big, right? If you're working on refining requirements, that's, that's not, um, it's not a technical skill. Right, you can mix some technical stuff in there, but if you can talk to someone about data and what they're trying to get out of it in, in, in a way that they can understand, that's gonna be hugely valuable. Um, you know, again, trying to understand what people are asking is, is big. Uh, asking questions to say, okay, you're asking, for, you're asking for this data. Let me try to understand, what are you gonna do with it? Do I have it right? You know, confirming that, your understanding is the same as their expectation. That's not a technical skill. Um, I would say persistence is very important also. I don't know if that's a skill, maybe that's more of a characteristic, but you know, when you're dealing with data, sometimes it can get frustrating. Uh, and I would say that uh, humility might be, a good, uh, might be a good trait because oftentimes getting someone else involved can help solve a problem. Um, I wouldn't say that I often suffer from humility, but I have found that um, paired programming, for instance, is not only fun, but super useful, right? I, when, I, when I start to explain some of my code to someone else, uh, I'm forced to slow down uh, and get out of my head a little bit. And then I can see, I can see what I'm building a, a lot better. And oftentimes they don't need to do anything. Just me slowing down enough to explain it will help me figure out what an issue is. So I think, um, I, I don't know if humility is the right word, but, but basic, but maybe openness to talking to other people and being, uh, I guess, 
vulnerable enough to show off your product and let them poke around at it, uh, that would be a good trait to have. Um, being able to take changes, right? People are never going to be satisfied with the data product the first time that they see it. I never, ever, ever seen that happen, right? And don't take it personally, right? Uh, you're, you want to build a good uh, analysis for them or a good data product. Part of that is being uh, adaptive to, to changes. Um, speaking of that, I would say that the agile methodology would come in very handy. I mean, I've worked in two agile shops now, uh, and it gets the customer together with the technical team early and often. And what, what that allows is... Um, instead of someone going away for weeks or months and developing something and then bringing it back and finding out that it doesn't work you know there are these two week sprints where basically you're able to demo the content as you're developing it so if there needs to be a course correction it can happen more in real time than uh, after long periods of, of of development and no customer input um the if you if you google uh safe um uh, what is it? Uh, Scrum Agile Framework for Enterprises. There's some there's some good stuff in there. Um, and understanding how Agile works. I mean, you could do something in analysis just working as a Scrum Master, for instance. Um, you know, I think uh, working as a Scrum Master could lead to that. Could be a whole another career, and it could be pretty fun working in Agile. Scrum Master, product owner, release train engineer. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, Agile is pretty cool. Um, and it's not super technical, but if you have a little bit of a technical background and you enjoy Agile and you could talk to technical people, uh, that could be very valuable for you. Um, oh, thank you, Cheris. Hopefully I said that right. You got the link. Um, cool. Let's see. This is fun, you guys. Um, is there much work in data analysis with a bachelor's in comp sci or is an MS necessary? Uh, you're talking to the wrong guy, I think, because I don't have either and I've done okay. I've had plenty of breaks, but I think experience is, I mean, if you're able to get in the door somewhere, um, that is, that's the biggest part, I think, these days. Um, and I'm going to actually jump in there real quick. Uh, master's degrees, I have a couple of those. <laughs> um, and I found, and I, I've been teaching for, goodness, 21 years. And I've been teaching in, all, I've always been teaching in te the technical area. And I will tell you some of the things that I found over the years with some of my master's students are that they are coming back to get a master's degree simply because they need it to advance in their career. Um, you know, I'm all about our MSDA program. I'm not saying, you know, but it, it's all about your needs and, and the needs of your organization. Um, I worked for an organization where I couldn't advance to a certain level without a doctorate. So here I go back to school again in 2006 to get a doctorate degree. So, if you, I think that our BSMIS program prepares students well. Um, our MSDA program gets students really knee deep, more knee deep than our BSMIS program. But there are some people who just have the technical background. And if they've been given, given an opportunity at their work uh, in your career, I wouldn't say you have to have a master's degree. Can it hurt you? Absolutely not. But, you know, it, it, it's just, it's something that you need to think about. Yeah, I mean, if you're in the door somewhere and you're, you want to take, I, I agree, Dr. Ford. I mean, if you're in somewhere and you're doing it to advance your career, it's not going to hurt you. I mean, it's, it's only going to help you. Um, but if you're doing it to get in the door somewhere else, you know, then uh, again, that's where, uh, again, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm going to go back to what Jacob Miller asked. Uh, when you said DS or DA companies, you know, data science and machine learning, I would say, are probably very closely related. 
I mean, data science, ML, and AI would almost lump in together. Um, this is a lot of a lot of similarities in the skill sets required there. Um, so, like, if you if you want to be a data scientist, and you're 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 wondering if you should stick with the AI ML program or switch over to a DS program. I don't know that I can answer that, but I think there's a lot of overlap between those skill sets from what I've seen. And I can't answer that in a manner of speaking. Um, as I explained to my students, and this has been based on my, my experience, we had a group of data scientists. Those were the statisticians. Those were the people that were using R. And, and building regression models and different statistical models so we could focus on certain variables that we wanted to measure. Um, and then our data analysts were people who, they, were, they, they wore kind of two hats. Some of them were using SQL to mine data, extract data. It just, it kind of depended. And then we also had the folks who worked a lot with visualization. And uh, so they kind of wore that, that SQL analytics hat, kind of like what Dave, David is talking about, um, you know, with the SQL background and the visualization background. So um, I think if you really like statistics, that data science, um, and, and again, this is my interpretation based on how my previous jobs have been structured. If you love all that statistical analysis, then by all means. Uh, but I'm also with Dave. Um, I, I ask a group of students in a class that I teach, what is, what is the biggest trend that you see in the next five years with data analytics? And they're like AI and ML. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely think that it's a nice, um, a really nice opportunity that goes hand in hand, hand in hand with data analytics. So Uh, I don't see any more uh, open questions here. Uh, please keep them coming if you have them. Otherwise, I can show you something that I did that, uh, in Tableau. If you're interested, um, it did it out of, as part of a networking group in um, the, the Twin Cities yes, uh, last year, just before the pandemic hit. Um, if there's any interest in that. If not, I don't need to show that, but I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, we want to see some stuff, Dave. <laughs> show us the good stuff. <laughs> so you I don't, should be yeah. able to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you I should be able to share. Let's see, share screen. Because I've, I've got it set to all panelists. So who can share, share screen, screen one. There you go. All right. So let me give you a little bit of background here. And by the way, I don't love the palette here, but it was something that we inherited from the greater MSP um, um, organization. So the, the, the background on this is this organization, the Greater MSP, basically works uh, as a nonprofit in the Twin Cities to help uh, drive or work with policymakers in government uh, and companies to make the Twin Cities competitive in the, in the US market, right? And so they helped standardize a number of metrics that are collected uh, in what are peer cities, considered to be peer cities for, for Minneapolis. I wouldn't say that Seattle or San Francisco necessarily are, are peer cities. I think they're just there, or Chicago for that matter, or Boston are peer cities, but they might be benchmarks. So the purpose of this was to show a number of different categorizations of metrics and see how the Twin Cities are performing compared to their, their peer cities. Uh, so this was a printed dashboard uh, uh, like a physically printed dashboard uh, uh, on glossy paper. Uh, if I was thinking, I would have shown it to you, but they wanted to make it more interactive. And so the team that I was on, what we were charged with is making an attractive, interactive visual dashboard that preserved what they had on a piece of paper. Um, the, the data cleansing 
is what took most of the, of the time. And to do that, we use Alteryx. Uh, but because Alteryx is a proprietary tool, one of the guys on, our, on my team uh, redid it in Python, right? So they can, they can use it free of cost, basically. So as new data comes in, it will flow through into the, uh, into the dashboard, right? So as they, if they collected 2020 data and put it in here, it, it should appear. That's how we engineered it. So basically on the side here, we have a number of different categories, right? Business vitality, economy, and so on and so forth. And so if you click on one of these, it will show the, the corresponding metrics down here. So if I go to economy, for instance, we can see average weekly wage. And then what it will do is that we have a bump chart here so that we can see where the Twin Cities stacks up, no pun intended, relative to the, to the peers. Uh, in terms of rank and also in terms of peer numbers, right? So we can see, you know, Minneapolis is really the middle of the pack, whereas San Francisco, no surprise, is number one. People, you need a lot more money to work out there. So you, I would sure hope that the wage is higher. Boston, no surprise if that's up there in Seattle, right? But, but it, you can see the data is more tightly clustered once you get below those top three. Um, and so again, someone could look at this and say, <clears throat> all right, I'm in Minneapolis and maybe I'm not competing with this, with the San Francisco and the Boston and the Seattle, but maybe I want to poach some talent from Chicago. All right, I, I see Chicago. Uh, I'm beating Chicago. I'm, maybe I can poach some talent from Chicago, right? Um, that's something that this would, an insight that this would give me. Um, employment gap. How well does the Twin Cities perform relative to the to its peers? And it seems to be on on a, on a decline. Um, uh, let's see, yearly job growth. <laughs> you have an outlier here with Charlotte. That makes the rest of it very hard to see. <clears throat> the Twin Cities. Um, Oh, one of the interesting things here, if I go back to business vitality, uh, new establishments, very, very low. There aren't a lot of startups uh, in the Twin Cities. But if you're able to stick around, let's see. Come on, I have a plug in. But if I'm able to stick around, I do better, the Twin Cities do better than a lot of, uh, of the peers. So if I can encourage, as a policymaker, if I can encourage more startups, um, you know, it, it might have a huge impact on the local economy because once something is established, it seems to do pretty well. Now this is all pre-pandemic, so, um, you know, obviously things may, may have changed, but. I'll stop there. <clears throat> um, I know we're, we're just about at time. I'm happy to keep going though, by the way. Um, let's see. Tableau is awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, Tableau Public is free for anyone. <clears throat> um, so, and yes, this is where we publish it. The data is not in Tableau Public, I don't think. But I think the data, um, let's see. By the way, I, this was part of, uh, I stumbled across this as part of a data visualization user group in the Twin Cities. Um, so again, another plug for tapping into your local uh, networking meetups, if you can. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put I'll put a link in the chat for this if you want to poke around at it a little bit. And I'll I'll stop there. If there's nothing local for meetups, do you know of any online groups? Good question, Lisa. I, I would think I haven't done a ton of networking over the last year, is because I've been in this new job that's been taking a lot of my time. Um, but I know that last year after the pandemic started, basically whatever was in person went virtual, right? And so we, 
I met the team that I worked on this in person once, and then we worked on it virtually over the course of uh, a couple of other sessions spread out over several other months. So I'm sure that you can find uh, some opportunities for virtual networking. Um, Tableau, Tableau has user groups. I would say that would be a good place to start. Um, Tableau yeah. is actually doing their conference virtual and it's not, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Uh, By the way, they have great, it, it's part of the conference. I don't know if it's part of the free conference, but the, um, they do a very good job of training people or, or I know going to the in-person conference, like you yeah. sit down with a problem. Uh, and I learned a lot about Tableau in those sessions. I don't know if they post those for free. Um, but yeah, if you I'm not sure. Those, I've, I've signed up for the, the one that's coming up. So I'm interested because I've always attended. In fact, Dave and I attended a couple of those Tableau conferences together. Um, yep. So I'm interested to see just how they handle, handle this one. Um, yeah, I, I, thanks for that, Lily. Um, yeah, there are, um, that, that's really good information. I appreciate that. Charles says we have Power BI. Would you suggest Tableau over? Do you I mean think you're trying overly? to say Power BI? Yeah. Uh, I spent a day we learning about Power that today, didn't we, Dave? <laughs> we did. I don't love Power BI. Um, I didn't find it to be as intuitive. There were some things that I, were very simple to do in Tableau that I that are just not possible in Power BI, at least that without uh, custom code which would be very hard to, from, in my opinion, uh, maintain. That said, I know a lot of people love Power BI. Power BI is, is a lot cheaper than Tableau. Tableau can get expensive depending on how many people you, you have. Power BI, if you're in a Microsoft shop, Power BI makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Um... In my previous role, we actually used both Tableau and Power BI. We had um, we had some folks who I like to call my power users, my power data users, people who really wanted to see the data and dig into it. So for those we those folks, we use Power BI for certain certain uh, analytics and reports that they were after. But for the the general population. Um, we use Tableau dashboards, but um, th there are definitely some things, especially if you, if you're a Microsoft shop, as Dave said, um, and you've got people who are used to using Excel, um, yeah. you know, and they're doing more and more with Power BI. Of course, Gartner has the Gartner group. I don't know if anybody, um, if you guys are familiar with the Gartner group, they do this really great um this really great analysis every year and Power BI has been up there leading over the last couple of years over Tableau and Click. Um, so, you know, anyway, it, 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 it's all about the organization and the tools they can afford to use. So that in some cases, some yeah. cases, I'm gonna say that. And, and, it's great to, and it's great to know Samuel and Charles say they, they love Power BI. Yep. Uh, some people do. And, you know, I can see, I can see it being attractive as someone who learned Tableau first. Power BI right, reminded me more of Cognos, I have to say, and I didn't <laughs> love Cognos. But that said, Power BI, you know, you, you get a much bigger canvas to work on. Tableau limits you to, you know, your dashboards can only be this big. Power BI, you can, you can expand it, you can make it as big as you want. Uh, there are certain things that are easier to do in, in Power BI, some formatting things that in Tableau, you're like, gosh, this would be so much easier. Uh, but I think cost is a big differentiator uh, for, for Power BI. <clears throat> and um, again, I mean, you can you, you literally connect directly to uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Well, you can do that in Tableau too, but they're, they're integrated much better because they're not both Microsoft products. So that's why I said, if it's a Microsoft shop, Power BI probably makes a lot of sense. That's a really good question. One of the things on it is, and I actually 
pointed a student. I'm sorry, David, let me talk over you. No, but please. I actually pointed a student to a, a video on uh, Tableau Public. They actually post some really great videos out there, how-to videos. And Tableau Public is free. You can that's, use it for free. Right. Yeah. And um, so if you want to learn more about Tableau, there, again, there is an area in Tableau Public that are that there's some really great free videos. Um, I had a student in, like I was, like I said in the chat, because I'm the program director, I primarily teach the, the MSDA capstone these days. And I had a student that really wanted to do more with Tableau. And um, but she's like, I really, I didn't, you know, we didn't really learn a lot of how to use Tableau in the MSDA program. And I said, here, here's some, here's some things, some links I'm going to give you. So there is, um, there are some really good videos out there under Tableau Public. So you don't have to go poking around on YouTube to look for them. Um, yeah, that's the catch. You have to publish everything out there or yeah, that's, that's the catch. So um, anyway, Power BI, um, you can save to your, that's the one nice thing. You can save anything that you're working on to directly to your computer. Um, that's the difference between the version of Power BI that you can download and Tableau Public. Um, so uh, anyway, just wanted to kind of say that. Um, I know Coursera. Uh, Coursera, I hate to recommend that only because there's really good stuff out there, but <laughs> I, I don't want to give them up over us, learning from us, but um, uh, there's some also, you guys, uh, you might have, you know, we have all access to the LinkedIn videos. Um, I think there might be some um, that, uh, some videos out in LinkedIn. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, the uh, the Iron Biz Challenge that's pretty awesome. Yeah, LinkedIn Learning does have a lot of great Tableau courses. They also have good Power BI courses. And if you're a student and you've got the LinkedIn account here, you can look around and and look for some of those tools. So I just Google Power BI really quick, and I'm reminded that uh, you know there's probably there's probably a network in your area that yeah. uses Power BI. Maybe if you can tap into one of those, uh, yeah. that might be a good way of learning it. Right? Yeah, those user groups are awesome. When I oh, yeah. first started learning Alteryx, um, because Dave and I started using it at the same time because we got it at the same time, yeah. um, the, some of the, the, the communities in Alteryx were absolutely outstanding. I get stuck on some syntax and put it in there and, and once I had someone from Alteryx email me and say, hey, let's let us help you out with this. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to turn that down. So I don't have any thoughts on that, Lily. Um, <laughs> I have no thoughts on that. Um, I think that, you know, because only because it's kind of competing with us. But I have ideas. I have ideas. I can't share them right now, but I have ideas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mark asks a, uh, an interesting question. He says, in my job, I have to export chatbot data to CSV. Currently using Excel, but hitting the million row limit, is there a better way of working the data? Yes, use a database. Uh, I mean, you Postgres is open source. You should be able to use something like DBeaver or DataGrip as, uh, I can't remember who recommended it. Was it Jamie? You, you should be able to create a database for free. Um, yeah. And I don't know what your SQL background is, but if you can get it into a database, it's going to make your life better for sure. Well, <laughs> I would say, I mean, you can even, even access. I don't love access, but access yeah. would do the same thing. Well, but if we, you have a, yeah. We use PostgreSQL and MIS 407 for you BSMIS students. And anyone who, if you haven't entered the MSDA program, you have to have a SQL background to enter the MSDA program. So if you don't, we require you to take the MIS 407. So you guys should have some background in SQL and Postgres SQL. So I'm just saying you should. <laughs> Hopefully you've had a good instructor that did a great job. I know I've got a couple of them out there that, that hold study sessions on Saturdays. So anyhow. 
Um, Lily asks a question. Yeah, Any I, thoughts I, on that's one I said I didn't really want to get into because. This, oh, okay, sorry. It's kind I of don't know that I can. I don't think compete, I can answer It's a that. competing thing with us, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else out there? Anyone else have questions? I see we still have a fair amount of people. Yeah, uh, I know. This is fantastic. I love talking about data and I love that you guys are asking questions. Um, I haven't done this before, but uh, it's again, it's been really fun and, I, and I'm excited to be here. And well, thank I you, think Dr. You Ford, are a for fabulous choice my, for my first, my first ever uh, data analytic programs webinar. So I, yeah, I, and I want to thank you all for for attending and, and asking questions. Definitely, definitely. Um, yes, Charles, I posted in the chat and part of the chat, you'll find my email address. I would love to hear from you attendees, the students um, or prospective students. I, we may have some prospective students, what you would love, what topics you would like to, to, to hear. And I'll bring in industry panelists. Uh, I, I know I've got some absolutely fantastic faculty members on my staff, but I, I, I really like to bring in people who are, um, who live and breathe this every day, every single day. Um, because I, I know that I've heard from students who are getting ready to graduate. Okay, now what do I do? So um, anyway. Uh, I think that's a wrap then, unless someone has any closing questions, but thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. This yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Ford, for inviting me and, and thank you absolutely. all for Absolutely.